moment. Just making sure everything here is working on this end. Right, so let's get started. I am Iongron, the server owner and lead developer of Aralith, a Neverwinter Nights persistent world. A very large Neverwinter Nights persistent world with several thousand players. Certainly over the year, over the years since we launched nearly 20 years ago, I think we've had upwards of 20,000 individual players. So it's fair to say that I have some experience of creating and running content for Neverwinter Nights. And in these videos, I'm going to be showing how to do exactly the same. This is going to be an introduction from the very first steps in how to create a world using the Neverwinter Nights engine. I'm taking this from the very beginning to the very end. At the end of these videos, someone watching should be able to run their own persistent world. For this, I'm going to be using, as you can see here, the Gigashatten's Persistent World Engine version 4. Now, Gigastatten was a developer in the early days of Neverwinter Nights that made certain adjustments to the engine to make it uh, user-friendly. One might also call it idiot-proof, which has certainly been useful for me. With this engine, you can create a world, get your spawns working, your crafting system, your NPC merchants, everything running without any experience of coding. That is a huge lift that this engine does on your and our behalf. So that's what I'm going to be using. It can be downloaded from the Neverwinter Nights vault, which is why I'm starting with this page. You can see it here, Gigastatten's Persistent World Engine, Volume 4. I'll just read what Mithrius wrote about it because it gives as good an introduction as I ever could. This is the final version of Gigastatten's engine. It's developed for Aralith, along with a couple of first enhancements I made when I joined the Aralith team. It is a fully functional Persistent World engine which uses only the Bioware database, so no need for Neverwinter Nights X, external databases, etc. Giga was not a fan of comments. So while it is an excellent and detailed engine, it also requires a high level of familiarity with Neverwinter Night script and code in general to be able to effectively modify it. The first changes we made beyond this were to start using Neverwinter Night X, which I'll talk about later, and to start porting the functions from Bioware database to um, my SQL, making the engine much more flexible and powerful as well as improving its performance. However, the great benefit of this version is that you can literally download it and run it in Neverwinter Night server with no additional setup required, ideal for trying out new persistent world concepts. I'm happy to offer support on it, though probably best to ask on Aralith.com as there's a few of us there who know the engine well. Okay, so that was written by Mithrius, the former owner of um, Aralith, who also runs his own separate server on Neverwinter Nights. And he said that there are a few of us who know the engine well. Well, I don't think anyone knows it as well as him, but certainly from the area building I do. And that's what we're going to be using. Just to pick up on a couple of the comments that he made there, as he said, your high familiarity with the script and code to modify it. But that's just for modifying it. It is plug and play. So that is not necessary. The second thing is, you know, porting functions to an external database. Um, yeah, it definitely helps. But equally, it's not something you need to do for this engine to work. That is really the key point here. And the NWNX that he referred to is a, well, it's effectively a modding community and an extremely complex 
plugin for Neverwinter Nights used by many of the servers that gives it all kinds of new functionality. But it is part of the modding community and not part of the base game. Again, you don't need to use it to get something running on this engine. And when it comes to performance, you know, you're really going to only run into performance problems, serious performance problems, when you have a great many players. And that is a problem not many servers come up against on Neverwinter Night. So I wouldn't give that too much thought now. Of course, not all persistent worlds use this engine, and I'm sure many of them do a lot of things better but the great advantage of this is its ease of use and also the fact that because Aerolith is so has been so popular over the years many players are familiar with its systems and functions so if you create something on this engine many of the existing never went tonight's communities will e will immediately be familiar with what they encounter here so, uh, let me go back to what these videos will be about. I'm going to launch this engine and I'm going to go step by step through every process in creating a world. From how to manage the files to how to set up areas and then in later videos using the Dungeon Master client to set up monster spawns and crafting recipes and show you how you can effectively DM using the tools that are included for DMs in this engine. So it's not just using the tools there, it's also using the DM client, but that will come later. There's going to be a number of these videos. Uh, this one won't be so long as I have some real life things to do. This is just going to be the very first. At the end of the, these videos, as I say, I hope that anyone watching it will then be able to go and create their own persistent worlds and get it up on the Beamdog server so people can play it. And what I'm also going to do is through the course of these videos, I'm going to create the framework for a new persistent world. So you could take what you learn here to create something totally fresh but I'll also offer what we have as the end product at the end of these videos by means of some kind of competition, either here on Twitch or on our Twitter account or forums, so someone can actually take what I've made at the end of this and use it as a springboard to create their own server. It will effectively be, hopefully, a functioning persistent world albeit a small one so um, yeah let's get started you download this and you put it in your module folder which you can see mine here uh, mine's in my documents neverwinter nights module there it is i've unzipped it i've put it in there gigashaffen once it's open once it's in there i can go ahead and open it which i will do now, of course, I hope it doesn't crash or that'll make these videos stop very quickly. So let's have a look. Choose the launch or a tool set option. And then it will bring up a list of the modules that you have available. Here is the list. Sorry, it's opened it on the other screen, which I'm not streaming, so I'll move that over in a minute. So, okay, let's find it. It's called Gigashaffen. So, a quick word about this. Um, one other thing I should have mentioned about this engine is this is server-side only, not client-side. If you use this, your players will not be required to download any external content. No mods, no hacks. They can just log in without needing to take any further steps whatsoever. Everything this engine offers is on your side, not theirs. Now, this also means that there isn't any assets that are not included in the base game. One advantage of this is every asset that you see here is fully supported by Beamdog. The disadvantage is, of course, some of the community-created assets are excellent. Um, and... 
as a result, um, you know, you're missing out on some quality. When you become more familiar with um, modded assets, the site I showed you earlier, the uh, Giga, the um, Neverwinter Nights Vault here, I'll just take it to its main page. This is an online uh, repository of all the mod contents for Neverwinter Nights 1 and Neverwinter Nights 2. New tile sets, new creature models. There's some amazing stuff there. Integrating it into your server requires players to download that same content, or at least most of it. It can be fun to browse around, but if you're starting from scratch, I really would say ignore it to begin with, and uh, just get familiar with the engine as it stands. There's a lot there you can already work with. So let's go back to the tool set. So here we are, it's open. You can see along the top, gigastatten.mod. Well, okay, that's the first thing I want to do. Um, presumably, if you've downloaded this, you want to be able to return to the original version. So before we change it, let's rename it. So I'm just going to save as, and sorry, you have to forgive my huge list of modules there. It's just different things I've been working on over the years. So this um, new world, I am going to call Harper Chronicles for reasons I will explain later. Now, the reason I've done that is just because the original Gigastatten one I downloaded will remain in my module folder, and any changes that I save will be under this Harper Chronicles mod. I did that straight away because the truth is the serve the tool set will sometimes crash. If it does, it gives you the option to load a backup, and I want that all to be under a different name. So, um, yeah, let's get started. There's going to be a lot of menus. These icons along the top, the drop-down menus also along the top, and this list on the left with areas, conversations and scripts and another one that will open on the right as soon as we've got our first area loaded. So let's let's open areas. Now normally if you create a module from scratch there aren't any areas but this includes a framework and some essential server functions. And look, there's also some uh, demos which can help. And uh, one area from Aralith's City of Cordor. I'm not sure quite why that's on there, but there we are. Um, some essential conversations which are needed. As I say, this is everything you need to start your own persistent world. And these conversations are part of that. So I'll quickly go through these areas at the top here. Um, if you're wondering what these curious letters are before the name of the areas, the areas here are Persistent World Engine Loading, Dungeon Master Area, Inventory and Trade. Um, that is just changes the color of them when they load up. So, okay, uh, first area, Death. This is where the sound on. I'll turn that off. Turn the lighting off so you can at least see. Okay, totally empty area with a soul guardian. If a character dies, they go to this area, they speak to the soul guardian in order to return to the living world through by using this light pillar for which they will take an experience point penalty. Any value you can change, you can change the theme of this area. It's really just the essentials of having the soul guardian and the light. You can change everything else. If you want to change values such as death penalties, of course, that requires a going in and adjusting scripts. There are plenty of people in the Neverwinter Nights community that know enough about coding to be able to adjust such scripts. But for the sake of these tutorials, I'm going to assume that we're not going to be changing existing scripts with this engine. 
Okay, so the loading area. Um, this is basically where a character will start. Um, normally, you put a gateway in here to the world itself. Often a lot of servers need a little out of character area where you can put signs up explaining the world and the rules. Um, also, it allows them to do their sub race selection. Any preparation they need before they're in the game in character can be done here. And then you literally just put a door or a transition into your world proper, which again we'll come to later. Um, the dungeon master area. This is a central area for the dungeon masters on your server. Let's have a look at it. A place for them to sit. A message board where they can leave notes for each other. Um, this is where the dungeon masters start. On this light, this pillar at the end here can be interacted with to reset the server, uh, which you will want to do from time to time just to address any issues. And the soul cage. The soul cage can be used to ban problem players from your server. It's uh, easy to use. Everything can be explained. Everything can be explained and seen in game on descriptions by any DMs using it. The inventory area. This is really replaces the need for a database. These are master containers for all the various chests and corpses a character may open in game. These large selection that I've highlighted here for all the different types of base creature. You can see here shape changer, undead, vermin. The limit, which is set by a variable, GS limit 100, means you can put 100 items in here. You can take that as far as 500 if you want to. But basically, you put the items in here, let's say a hundred different items. When a creature dies, it will select three or four of those items randomly and it will appear on the creature's corpse. The same goes for these treasure containers. Um, unique treasure. Well, I'm not, I, we're not actually using that currently. I'll have to check to see how that one works because that's, that's for um, a special treasure container which which um, we will come to later, but for all the others here, treasure, that's for treasure chests, weaponry, that's for weapon racks, um, armor, literature, bookshelves, junk, just random crates and barrels, and player base inventory, that's what the characters, anyone starting in your world will start with whatever you put in this chest. With all of the others, again, these are the master containers. You do it in the DM client, not here. All of this is done in the DM client. You go in, you put whatever you want in these chests, and when a character opens a chest in the game, they get a selection of what's inside. So let's say you put 500 different things in treasure container. That's your master container for your treasure chests in game. Anything in those, anything in this container will get yeah, selected when opening a chest. And these are just places for you to uh, store. This here is an enchantment basin for improving objects, a prismatic mirror and a distorted mirror. These are all things that also appear for players in game. Um, the enchantment basin allows you to add properties to items and the distorted and prismatic mirror allow you to change appearances. The reason this is in the inventory area is just if you're a DM and you need to create an item for a quest or change the appearance of an NPC, it can be done in here. So, um, let's have a look at the next area, trade. Again, this is something that you use in-game, not in the tool set, okay? Um, trade will allow you to create recipes. Aralith has a crafting system based upon a number of crafting disciplines, um, cookery, forging, alchemy, art crafting, 
You can see the workstations here. Again, these appear in game. Tailoring, art, crafting, cookery, forging. You can see them listed here. And by means of this sign and this barrel, you can create recipes that will appear as crafting recipes for characters in game as they develop their skill in crafting. It is all explained in game. Like with the inventory area and the dungeon master area, there is nothing you need to do when creating a world in this area. This is all done in game on the DM client, so we come to it later. And really, that's it. These areas will take over your core database functions. Also, you don't need to add creatures. You can see over here, paint creatures. Again, um, when it comes to creating actually enemy spawns and creatures, in this engine, you don't need to use the um, default. You don't need to use the default Neverwinter Night system. It can be done in game. So, let's uh, just quickly explain the menus. Just check the time, see how much time I have left. So, areas, when you create an area, this is where it will appear. Conversations, these are literally, as it says, files that detail the conversations that you might create with NPCs. Scripts, these are, yeah, just pieces of code for in-game functions. You don't need to create any of your own if you don't want to. So, you know, you can largely ignore those unless you're a scripter. When you've got an area open, as I have here, then you get the right-hand menu. And this is the one as an area builder you'll be working most of all with. I'll quickly go through what these options are um, before I move on. So, this top one, paint terrain. This brings up the options for whichever tile set you're using. This one here you can see is castle. Features, groups, terrain. This allows you to set out preset tiles. You can see here library rooms, bedrooms, as well as just areas of floors and corridors and domes, uh, doors and so forth. Pretty, again, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Over here on the other side, paint start location. You only have one of these in the module. That's already in the loading area. You don't need to touch that when creating your world. Then we have the sub menus. menus. Paint creatures. Well, when using this engine, we're not going to be painting um, hostile monsters, only actual NPCs. And this is where we will find them. We'll talk about NPCs later on. Um, painting doors just allows you to paint different themed doors in doorways. As I said, encounters we actually use the DM client for. We don't generally do that in game. Um, this is where you can find the, all the items. The game includes a great many items. If you're adding any of these in, do have a good look at them. A lot of them will upset the balance of your game. It's very easy to create new items. Again, we'll do that in a later tutorial. Um, creating merchants. Thankfully, the Gigastatten engine has all these set merchants here. You can see arms and armor, clothing, accessories, food and drinks. This makes actually creating merchants incredibly easy. And it's an essential part of the game. And We'll be coming to that quite soon. Paint placeables. Okay, this is crucial. This is where you decorate the areas. This is where all the art model resources are. You can see it's divided into themes. Uh, battlefield, building adornments, containers and switches, military miscellaneous, miscellaneous interiors, parks and natures, pennants and signs, pennants and signs rather, uh, projectile trap, origin, secret object, Trade, academic farm, treasure, and visual effects. When you're decorating an area, you're going to be using this extensively. Sounds. Again, into categories. Animal, civilization, magic, nature, people, weather. Um, triggers. 
Triggers are things that when characters walk over, something happens. The most common of these is an area transition. Really, an area transition is just an area of floor that you paint the transition on. There you can see it there. Characters step on that, it takes them to a new area. You often see these at the edge of maps. It's also used for traps and other things. And then waypoints, which you know we could talk about more about later. The most obvious of these are map waypoints that tell you where things are. In every one of these palettes, you have two options, standard and custom. The standard palette is that which is included in the base game. These are core resources. Custom are the things that are included in the Gigastaten engine or that you create yourself. As you move on with module creation, you're going to be using custom resources much more than you use standard resources for almost all of these options. And I'll be explaining what all of these are as we go on. So the first thing, the first step you're always going to want to take is creating your areas. You're basically, you know, deciding on your um, deciding on your on your world. I can just see one of I'm streaming this also on Discord to our patrons. I can just see someone asking, "Do we get to the uh, uh, to, to watch this?" Yeah, I mean, this is going out on Twitch, and it will be saved on Twitch. With the other streams I've been doing, they've been Aerolith development with Q&A for our players. This is a bit different. I'm not making this specifically for the Aerolith community. I'm making it for the Neverwinter Nights community and specifically people that just want to get started with the tool set. Maybe they want to work for Aerolith in the future or maybe they just want to create their own persistent world. Or perhaps they're running a tabletop group and they would like to create something that can be used to facilitate games played online with their friends. This is something I've been meaning to do for a long while. I think uh, Neverwinter Nights could really benefit from having some proper introduction to using the tool set. And it goes without saying, you don't need to use the Gigastaten engine to learn from what I'm going to be talking about here. Equally, I should say, there are certainly people with more experience than I have in using the tool set. So there will be things I'm not going to be covering but I'm going to do my best to take it from yeah the very beginning okay so so far you know how to create a module you know where the module file goes in your folders here and you know how to open it one other thing I want to mention now which we're going to be returning to later is Never, the tool set includes an option for exporting. This allows you to export resources that you've created. I'm going to say now, don't use this. Don't ever use it. It will create an earth file, which you can then, then share. It's not really needed. The more advanced way is to go into your module folder. When you've got a module open, not when you haven't, it creates a folder called temp0. You can see it here. When you have a module open, it creates individual files for every resource currently in your module. All the areas, all the scripts, all the conversations, all the creatures. You can see here there are 4,121 items. If you need to extract something you've created, to put it in a different folder, save it for a rainy day, transfer it to another module, you grab it out of the temp0 folder, and when you have the module open that you want to put it in, slot it in. It's, it's just easier than dealing with Earths. So, okay. Um, again, we'll just check the time. Okay, I've got a little bit of time left on the first of these videos. So, let's get started with areas. Right-click on areas and select new. This is really where you want to get started. And then it brings up a list of tile sets. Now, these are all the base game tile sets, including the ones that were added after we worked on Tyrants of the Moon Sea. I should say for anyone watching that isn't familiar with uh, who I am, I was also the lead level designer on the 
Neverwinter Nights premium module, Tyrants of the Moon Sea, which allowed me to create, you know, official Forgotten Realms content using the Neverwinter Nights engine. It was a tremendous amount of fun. And this was one of only two premium modules released after the Enhanced Edition. And as part of that, we added a lot of new resources to the game. New creatures, new models, and new tile sets, which you will find in your list here, such as Medieval City 2. So, every tile set is basically a themed palette. What you're looking at behind here, this is Castle original Neverwinter Nights tile set. If you want to create a castle area, you use the castle tile set. And here they are. Some of them are better than others. Some of them have more features than others. I will, um, I could go through each of these and review them and say what they are which certainly I think makes sense, but um, I will do that in an entirely separate stream um, where I solely look at the different tile sets and explain what they are, their uses and limitations. For now, you can tell what they are by basically reading them. City interior, city exterior, crypt, desert, drow interior, dungeon, early winter, Forest, Fort Interior, Frozen Wastes, Illithid Interior, Lizard Folk Interior, Medieval City, Medieval Rural, Mines and Caverns, Ruins, Rural, Rural Winter, Sea Caves, Sea Ships, Sewers, Steamworks, Tropical, Underdark. So that is it. Unless you're using hack content, everything you create will be limited to using these. But, you know, some of them are really versatile. And with a bit of inventiveness, you can create almost anything that, you, that you're thinking of. Now, I'm going to presume that this new persistent world that we're making is going to have not many players. Now, let's just true with Neverwinter Nights in the modern age. There were great many developers, not so many players, and aside from a very few exceptions, of which Aronith is one, most persistent worlds are run for small communities. Now that's no bad thing. It's much closer to emulating the tabletop experience where you have DMs working alongside players creating stories and narratives. But of course, the persistent world is designed to work without DMs present. But as a result, I'm not going to be expecting hundreds of players on this server. So the framework I'm going to create will be for something more um, intimate, shall we say. So what one generally wants to do is to have a central hub area for your players. Now, this could be a castle, a guild house, a town, a village. This is effectively an area where the characters hang out, they resupply, they have their own homes that they can decorate, and store things, they can visit banks. It's not only an area where all the ut core utility is, it's also the area where your central narrative will be framed. So... The first area I'm going to want to think about is what's going to be our hub. Now, if the server grows, you can have more than one hub. But as I say, I'm going to be creating at least the framework for this new persistent world on the idea that there is only going to be one hub. After we've done the central hub, we then start thinking about the surrounding land and dungeons. So... Um, for our central hub, honestly, I'm very tempted to use the um, medieval city made by Zverkules, the tile set that we that we um, that we used for Tyrants of the Moon Sea, because I mean it is it is beautiful. It's definitely uh, it's definitely special, and it looks a lot more modern. It can also be a bit trickier to use. So 
I need to decide what is our central hub going to be. I mean, I'm a bit cautious of using a city. They're, they're incredibly versatile, but, you know, we may not have so many players. On Aralith, we have one of our servers called the Distant Shores, which uses a small village in the tundra as a hub, which works very well. In this case, I am wanting to use a castle. But you know what? I am going to go ahead and use Medieval City too because there is a castle in there that I rather like. And uh, yeah, it's not. It's a bit of a complex introduction to making an area, but you know, let, let's go ahead and use it. Okay, so once I've selected it, it's asking me the size. So um, I think we're just going to want this to be large and square. Um, the larger an area, the more problematic the performance. If you end up with a great many players, having them all in a single area, you know, it, it can be a problem. So I'm going to plan ahead a little bit. Rather than create the whole hub in one area, just in case whoever runs with this Persistent Worlds ends up with a great many players, I don't want them... I don't want them... Um, stuck with an area that's going to cause performance issues because it's so popular. So uh, I'm going to break the hub into into a couple of different areas. So let's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll go large, but I won't take any larger. You could enter any value you want here up to 32. So I'll just go with 16. Okay, so Finish. The area is now ready to be created. Click Finish to add the area to your module. Launch Area Properties dialog. I'm not going to do that now. Area Properties can be adjusted from the right-hand menu later, and that's a little tuition in itself. But we do want to open the area in the Area Viewer. Actually, you know, I made a pretty basic mistake there. This is fine, but I don't want it to be called Area 001. That's a bit lazy. So let me just uh, do that again and show you how to avoid it being being given the default name. I'll just remove that area, do exactly the same thing again. Area New Medieval City 2, and then let's give it the name. Now, the Harper Castle. It's all going to be lowercase anyway. This is what's called the ResRef for the file. Every file, every resource, be it a creature, an item, an area, it's going to have a name. It's also going to have a ResRef. The ResRef is the file name. You can change the name later, but the ResRef, will stay with whatever I enter now, whatever you enter during creation. That's why it's important to not let it use the default area 001. You want unique resrefs and you want to easily be able to navigate them. So I'm calling it the Harper base or lowercase. I can change the actual name as it appears to players later. Um, so large. There we are. So, this is the area. All the tiles are currently set to just cobble. So, that makes it look rather dull. But that's only because we haven't dressed it yet. So, um, yeah. Now, I would actually rather have it all to be grass to begin with. And then I can put walls around and have uh, something inside. So, um, to do that, and again, this is a bit of a handy trick, rather than having to go through changing every tile to grass, if I go up to edit here and to resize area, make it as small as it can go, it's 
go to 2, 2. I don't know why it's jumping back to 15. Okay, so that's as small as it will go. I change this to grass. Then I can resize it back to large. Now it's all grass. Fantastic. So I said castle. So I've decided that our hub is going to be a castle. So let's have a look. These are your terrain options. This is how you can change the actual set terrain. You can have it as buildings. If it's red, that means you can't place it. In this case, it means it has to be placed over cobble. Normally, if something's red, it means you're trying to put it on the wrong floor type. So buildings only go over cobble, not over grass. Castle, however, can go over grass. Then we have chasms, which create a big drop. A razor to yeah, raise something you've used. Grass to raise lower the terrain. Um, to create a road. Uh, rock. Presumably that is done at the side of buildings. A stream. Some trees. A wall. And water. So uh, actually I'm going to start with raise lower terrain. I want my castle to be slightly raised. So see here, I'm just going around and create a raised platform. If you can't see it very clearly, you can always try clicking here up on display shadows. Sometimes that can, not in this case, presumably the area doesn't have the shadows set, can help you see what you're looking at. Once I've got this big enough, again, I'm keeping it quite simple. The more advanced you get, the more perfectionist you be, the more detail you go into. Now you can see the shadow a bit more clearly as I scroll down. be big enough to place our castle on. And then I'll explain what I'm actually thinking for this uh, particular hub and framework of a persistent world. So, okay, now castle. There we are. Keep vibe to it. You can see I keep having to undo it here by edit because it's painting more than one tile. Sometimes that just happens. Okay, so. Castles, I recall, you can raise the terrain inside the castle, which is rather pretty. do some experimenting to decide exactly how I want this to look. Okay, I'm just going to click undo a lot. Back to its original shape. 
Okay, so I am going to create a castle here to be the central hub. It's going to take some experimenting to get it the way I want it. But the thinking I have for this particular persistent world that I'm going to create just by means of way of explaining how the tile set works, it's going to be a Harper castle, as the name gives away. And anyone that plays on this persistent world will be working for the Harpers, either as a member or as an adventurer that is being hired. The reason I've decided to do it this way is, as I explained earlier, or as I showed earlier, the different area options you have, let me bring them up again, you can see many of them are themed around climate. Here we can see tropical or um, frozen or desert. Now, if you're creating persistent worlds, very often, like Arolith, are based around a particular island or single location. Now, geographically, that's a bit tricky because having a jungle next door to a frozen waste is always going to appear a bit jarring. And also because when working on Tyrants, I had the enjoyment of creating actual Forgotten Realms content. And so that's kind of what I'd like this persistent world to be. Rather than it being an island or a single location with its own region, players are going to be able to travel around the Forgotten Realms themselves, travel around Faerun. The central hub will be a Harper Castle, which will be on an island or in a remote part of the world. And from there, by portal, they will be able to travel to different places in the Forgotten Realms on their missions. These different places will be our dungeons. There will also be a few smaller, easier dungeons based around the uh, Harper base itself. So we're going to have the Harper Castle. Characters will start there. They'll get equipped. There'll be a few local dungeons where they can do their first easy missions, you know, Often on servers, this is killing rats on a ship or going down to a dungeon to deal with goblins. So we're going to have our castle. We're going to have a few local easy dungeons and then a portal in the middle of the castle where characters can then visit different locations in the Forgotten Realms to achieve objectives as given to them by the heart. Now, if you're going to take this world and turn it into a new persistent world, the DMs can play the Harpers giving people these missions, or you can just do it simply by an NPC. But the advantage here is you can just keep creating content, versions of Forgotten Realms locations, and uh, swap them in and out as desired. You know, maybe you don't want areas to be always the same. Perhaps you want to change it every month so it rotates and characters have different missions in different parts of the world. Really, you could take it in any direction you want. So that's going to be my idea for a central hub and surrounding dungeons. If you're creating a persistent world yourself from scratch using what you learn here, you can do that any way you like. It doesn't have to be you know, a castle with a portal. As I say, it could be a village in the tundra. It could be um, a location in Vatsical or even in the New World. It doesn't have to be Forgotten Realms at all. I'm going to stick with Forgotten Realms because that's what the tool set offers. The creatures and a lot of the items, they reference the Forgotten Realms. I'm going to presume that anyone using this is wanting to create a Forgotten Realms server, but that's going to be my core idea for creating this yeah, this framework of a persistent world. So I'm going to create our central hub. I'm going to create uh, two or three local dungeons. As part of creating the central hub, I'm going to be doing the NPCs and the merchants and the items. As part of the dungeons, I'm going to create the spawns. I'm going to go through every stage of the process. Once we have the area made, I'll be doing some streams in the DM client, so we set things up there. At the end of it, we should have a working module that anyone is able to play. And as I say, the module that's created will then be offered to 
which whoever wins some kind of a competition, some way of determining if there's more than one person interested, who gets to take it and run with it, they'll be able to put it up alongside the other servers on Neverwinter Nights and just go wild. Um, there's a lot I haven't explained yet. All these various buttons along the top here and these drop-down menus. You know, it's going to come in slowly, but it, it should be uh, it should be pretty easy. So, um, I'll just see if there are any um, questions as of yet. Okay. So I have about another five or ten minutes. So I'm just going to try and finalize the shape of this castle. I'm not hugely fond of it because it creates these courtyards and I can't seem to break them off. So once you've created your terrain, which I've been doing castle, you then have groups. Groups are set buildings. Uh, you can see bridges estates, streets. We also have groups for city. All these different buildings you can have in the city. Different groups for using on a cliff top. Different groups for having on uh, grass. And different groups for having on water. Groups tend to be large. You can see a number here telling you how many tiles they cover. 1 by 2, 3 by 2, 4 by 2, and so on. Features, the very top menu, these tend to just cover one tile. So our castle is going to want a huge gate. So let's see, we're going to want it in the middle somewhere. Let me undo that. If you ever need to edit anything, just uh, undo. Just go to Edit, Undo, or Control and Z. I'll undo that. Let me try and rotate the huge gate so it's facing the right way. Good. There's our huge gate. That's where the characters will be coming in. going to raise this here. Okay, so I'm not going to use this tiny courtyard inside. That's just going to be dressing. Characters are going to come in into this courtyard and then go through a second door. You can see here, small door raised. So that's obviously a door that goes here. Oh, the other way around. I want a small door that leads into the castle there, but you seem to be able to create it. not so familiar with using the castle, so I'm just seeing if one can create a gate into the raised section. It doesn't seem so easy. Just experimenting, seeing if there is a way to do that. Okay, so slight change of plan. There's no tile included to have a door going up that rock face, sadly. So we will sometimes you can just click the raise to see what different options come up.
odd that he would have created this without the option to have a door leading in there. Again, I really just want a second door. So I'm just going to save. We're just going to have a second door leading in. So in this case, we have to have that second door at ground level. Oh, we've got a prism tower. Okay. Pretty cool. Okay, I think I might use that prism tower then rather than have raised terrain. Prism tower to be in there. I've got to make the castle itself bigger. To go back to the drawing board on creating this castle to get it the way that I want it, I might use a different um, might use a different tile to get it working. But okay, we'll come back to that in the next stream when I get the hub set up, at least in its basic shape. And uh, yeah, I will continue then. There'll be a number of these streams again. This was just the very first to let you know the plan. I hope these prove useful. Uh, the next one should come quite soon, so thanks for watching.